The Lymphatic System and Body Defenses, Chapter 12. So the what? The lymphatic system carries excess interstitial fluid from tissues back to the cardiovascular circulation and provides locations for immune cells to monitor the body. How? Via porous lymphatic vessels that take in fluids from the extracellular space and carry them through lymph nodes where immune cells scan the fluids for foreign particles and why fluid must be returned to the circulation via lymphatics to maintain cardiovascular function. The lymph nodes are necessary to monitor the body for infection. And you can see on this gentleman um, the placement of the nodes, but in the lymphatic system altogether. Of course, we'll get more into that as we go further into the lecture. So the lymphatic system is not generally something that comes to mind when we're talking about or thinking about body systems, um, but our cardiovascular system or immune system are pretty reliant, not pretty reliant, they are reliant on the proper functioning of the system. Um, it consists of two parts, a meandering network of lymphatic vessels and then various lymphoid tissues and organs scattered throughout the body. The lymphatic vessels transport fluids that have escaped from the blood back back into that cardiovascular circulation and the lymphoid tissues and organs house phagocytic cells and lymphocytes that are important for immune system function. So as blood circulates through the body, nutrients, waste, gases are exchanged between the blood and interstitial fluid. That fluid that remains behind in the tissue spaces uh, which can be up to as much as three liters a day, becomes part of the interstitial fluid. Um, excess, this excess tissue fluid, as well as plasma proteins that escape from the blood, they have to be carried back to the cardiovascular circulation so that the blood volume is sufficient to continue to operate properly. Remember, we just learned about uh, blood volume, how that how the exchange happens in capillary beds, but you need volume in order to maintain appropriate cardiac output, uh, appropriate blood pressure. If the fluid does not enter back into that cardiovascular vascular system circulation, um, fluid will start to accumulate into, into the tissues producing edema, which we talked about briefly um, in the last chapter, in the last lecture when we were talking about heart failure. Um, it's swelling. Excessive edema impairs the ability of cells to make exchanges with the interstitial fluid and ultimately the blood. And the function of the lymphatic vessels is to form an elaborate drainage system that picks up that excess interstitial fluid, now called lymph, and return it to the blood. So in the figure on the left, beginning at the bottom of the figure, we see that lymph uh, which begins as tissue fluid derived from the blood capillaries, enters the lymph capillaries, travels through the lymphatic vessels and the lymph nodes, and enters the bloodstream via the great veins at the root of the neck. Uh, the lymphatic vessels, also called lymphatics, form a one-way system. The lymph flows only towards the heart. Uh, the microscopic lymph capillaries weave between the tissue cells and blood capillaries and the loose connective tissues of the body and absorb that leaked out fluid. They're very similar to blood capillaries, but they're remarkably permeable that um, they're so permeable that they were once thought to be opened at one end. Um, but instead, the edges of the endothelial cells forming their walls loosely overlap one another, forming like mini valves, which you can see here on the right. They act as one way swinging doors. Excuse me. The flaps are anchored by fine collagen fibers to surrounding structures and gape open when the fluid pressure is higher in the interstitial space, allowing fluid to enter the lymphatic capillary. When the pressure is higher inside the lymphatic vessels, the endothelial cell flaps are forced together, preventing the lymph from le leaking back out and forcing it along the vessel forcing it to continue to move towards the heart. And this image is just showing the distribution of the lymphatic vessels and nodes. Um, 
lymph is transported from the lymph capillaries through successively larger lymphatic vessels refer referred to as lymphatic collecting vessels until it's finally returned to the venous circulation through two large ducts in the thoracic region. The right lymphatic duct drains lymph from the right arm and right side of the head and thorax. The large thoracic duct receives lymph from the rest of the body. Both of these ducts uh, empty it, the lymph into the subclavian vein on their own side of the body. So you can kind of see that in this image. Like the veins of the cardiovascular system, lymphatic vessels are thin walled and the larger ones have valves to prevent backflow. Uh, it's a low pressure pumpless system. So it's transported by the same mechanisms that aid return of venous blood, that milking action of the skeletal muscles, pressure changes in the thorax during breathing, that is the musculatory and respiratory pumps. In addition, smooth muscle in the walls of the larger lymphatics contracts rhythmically, helping to pump this lymph along. So an issue that can occur because it is a low pressure pumpless system when we're still for long periods of time and parts of our body are dangling to gravity. For example, if you're sitting for a long time um, on an airplane or in class or listening to lecture, you know, some people can have a buildup of that lymph in their lower extremities because you're not necessarily contracting your muscles. You're you know, sitting still. So it can cause swelling. So a way you can do that is by doing things like ankle, or you can fix that as doing things like ankle pumps, you know, pointing your toe, pointing it towards your face, pointing it towards the ground. Um, and that is engaging the muscles of your lower leg, which is gonna help with venous return and with lymphatic return. Your lymph nodes. So your lymph nodes help your body protect, help to protect your body by removing foreign part materials such as bacteria, tumor cells. Um, large clusters are found in the inguinal, so your groin area, your axillary area, so underarm and cervical regions of the body in your neck. Um, contain macrophages and lymphocytes and they vary in shape and size. Um, the, the picture here is just the structure of a lymph node cut, cut longitudinally. Um, so the outer part of the node is the cortex. It contains collections of lymphocytes called follicles, many of which are dark, with dark staining centers called germinal centers. The centers enlarge when specific B lymphocytes, the B cells are generating daughter cells called plasma cells, which release antibodies. The rest of the cortical cells are lymphocytes in transit, uh, the so-called T cells that circulate continuously between the blood, the lymph nodes, and the lymphatic stream, performing their surveillance role. The medullary cords are inward extensions of the cortical tissue that contain both B and T cells. Phagocytic macrophages, uh, macrophages are located in the central medulla of the lymph node. Lymph enters the convex side of the lymph node through afferent, afferent lymphatic vessels. It then flows through a number of sinuses that meander through the lymph node and finally exits from the node as it's at its indented or concave region, the helium, via efferent lymphatic vessels. Because there are fewer efferent vessels draining the node than afferent vessels feeding it, the flow of lymph through the node is very slow kind of like sand flowing through an hourglass. This allows time for those lymphocytes and those macrophages to do what they do, performing those protective functions. Other lymphoid organs. So lymph nodes are just one of many types of lymphoid organs in the body. Others include the ones that you can see in this image, the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, pyres, patches, and the appendix as well as bits of lymphoid tissue that are scattered in epithelial and connective tissues. Uh, all of these organs have a predominant, they're predominantly made up of reticular connective tissue and lymphocytes. Uh, although all lymphoid organs have roles in protecting the body, only the lymph nodes filter lymph. So none of these organs uh, filter lymph. So the spleen is a soft organ located on the left side of the abdominal cavity, just beneath the diaphragm uh, that curls around the anterior anterolateral aspect of the stomach, so front and side, 
Instead of filtering lymph, the spleen filters and cleanses blood of bacteria, viruses, and other debris. As with the other lymphoid organs, the spleen provides a site for lymphocyte proliferation and immune surveillance. And its most important function is to destroy worn out red blood cells and return, them, some to, information. return them to the breakdown, return their breakdown products to the, to the liver. Sorry, Siri's acting up. Um, other functions of the spleen include storing platelets and acting as a blood reservoir, much like the liver. During hemorrhage, both the spleen and liver contract and empty their blood into the circulation to help bring blood volume back to its normal level. In the fetus, the spleen is an important hematopoietic, so blood cell forming site, but as a rule, the adult spleen produces only lymphocytes. Then we have the thymus. Uh, it functions at its peak level only during youth, is a lymphoid mass found in the anterior mediastinum overlying the heart. The tonsils are small masses of lymphoid tissue deep in the mucosa surrounding the pharynx. So I'm sure many of you have had your tonsils removed. Their job is to trap and remove bacteria or other foreign pathogens entering the throat. They carry out this function so efficiently that sometimes they become congested with bacteria, um, become red and swollen and sore, and a condition called tonsillitis. Pyres patches, uh, which resemble tonsils, are actually found in the wall of the distal small intestine. Lymphoid follicles are also located in the wall of the appendix, a tube-like offshoot of the proximal large intestine. Um, the macrophages of the pyres patches and the appendix are in an ideal position to capture and destroy harmful bacter bacteria, um, there which can commonly occur in the intestinal, intestinal system. <clears throat> um, and they prevent those harmful bacteria from penetrating the intestinal wall. Pyres patches, the appendix, and the tonsils are part of a collection of small lymphoid tissues referred to as the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, MALT, malt. Collectively, malt acts as a sentinel to protect the upper respiratory and digestive tracts from the constant attacks of foreign material entering those cavities. Um, and the reason why foreign materials are entering those cavities is because these are open systems, right? We breathe in through our mouth and nose, we eat through our mouth, so it, they're readily exposed to foreign materials, uh, bacteria, and viruses. Body defenses. So they're an innate and adaptive defense mechanisms. And together, these two things, these two sets of mechanisms make up the, your immune system. So the immune system rather than being like an organ system is a functional system and the most important immune cells are lymphocytes dendritic cells and macrophages excuse me <clears throat> so you can see here in this overview of the body defense systems that your innate non-specific defense mechanisms are your first line of defense and we'll talk more about um, these further on in the lecture. So first line of defense is going to be things like skin, your mucous membranes, secretions of the skin and mucous membranes that have some bacteriocytic properties. Second line of defense would be phagocytic cells, natural killer cells, antimicrobial proteins, the inflammatory response, and fever. And then to your adaptive specific defense mechanisms, the third line of defense, lymphocytes, antibodies, macrophages, and other antigen presenting cells. So innate body defenses, these are inherited, most often referring to the physical barriers that exist in our body. So we have surface membrane barriers, intact skin, intact epidermis, which forms a mechanical barrier that prevents entry of pathogens and other harmful substances into the body. Intact, uh, it also has an acid mantle um, and keratin. So the acid mantle, is the skin secretions that make the epidermal surface acidic, which inhibits bacterial growth. Sebum also contains bacteria killing chemicals. And keratin provides resistance against acid, alkalis, and bacterial enzymes. Intact mucous membranes. These form another mechanical barrier that prevents entry of pathogens. So the mucus traps microorganisms in respiratory and digestive tracts and nasal hairs uh, filter and trap microorganisms and other airborne particles in the nasal passages. 
cilia, propel debris, laden mucus away from the lower respiratory passages. Gastric juice contains concentrated hydrochloric acid and protein digesting enzymes that destroy pathogens in the stomach. The acid mantle of the vagina inhibits growth of bacteria and fungi. Uh, or fungi in female re reproductive tract and lacrimal secretion, so tears and saliva, Conti continuously lubricate and cleanse the eyes and oral cavity, contain lysosome, an enzyme that destroys microorganisms. And then we have cellular and chemical defenses. So the second line of defense. Phagocytes, which engulf and destroy pathogens that breach surface membranes, surface membrane barriers and macrophages. They are macrophages that also contribute to the immune response. Natural killer cells promote cell lysis by direct cell attack against virus infected or cancerous body cells do not depend on specific antigen recognition. The inflammatory response prevents spread of injurious um, agents to adjacent tissues, disposes of pathogens and dead tissue cells and promotes tissue repair and releases chemical mediators that attract uh, more immune cells to the area. Antimicrobial chemicals. So we have a co complement, which is a group of plasma proteins that lyses microorganisms, enhances phagocytosis by opsonization and intensifies inflammatory response. Interferons, proteins released by virus infected cells that protect uninfected tissue cells from viral takeover and mobilize the immune system. And fluids with acid pH. So normally acid pH inhibits bacterial growth. Urine cleanses the lower urine, urinary tract as it flushes the body. And then fever. Systemic response triggered by pyrogens. High body temperature inhibits, inhibits multiplication of bacteria and enhances body repair processes. Now let's talk a little bit more about that first line of defense, so the surface membrane barriers. Um, this includes your skin and mucous membranes. Uh, the acidic pH of skin secretions, called the acid mantle, and usually of the urine, which is the pH of 4.5 to 6, inhibits bacterial growth, and sebum contains chemicals that are toxic to bacteria. Vaginal secretions of adult females are also very acidic. Sticky mucus traps, many organisms or microorganisms that enter digestive and respiratory passageways. The stomach mucosa secretes gastric juice containing hydrochloric acid and protein digesting enzymes that both kill pathogens. And saliva and lacrimal secretions contain lysosomes, uh, an enzyme that destroys bacterial growth and bacteria. Some mucosa have structural modifications that fend off potential invaders. Mucus co coated hairs inside the nasal cavity trap those inhaled particles and the respiratory tract mucosa is ciliated. Uh, the, ciliated the cilia basically sweep dust and bacteria laden mucus um, superiorly towards the mouth, preventing it from entering the lungs so that we can cough it out. And although the surface barriers are quite effective, some microbes can get through. Um, also, as we know, some of these barriers are broken from time to time with small nicks, cuts, um, from shaving, a paper cut, scraping your knee. Uh, when this happens and microorganisms invade deeper tissues, the internal innate mechanisms uh, take over. Now let's talk more about the second line of defense, cells and chemicals. The body uses an enormous number of cells and chemicals. These defenses rely on the destructive power of cells called phagocytes and natural killer cells, on the inflammatory response, and on a variety of chemical substances that kill pathogens and help repair tissue. Fever is another nonspecific protective response. So natural killer cells roam the body in blood and lymph. They're a unique group of aggressive lymphocytes that can lyse and kill cancer cells so they can basically explode them virus infected body cells and some other nonspecific targets well before the adaptive arm of the immune system is enlisted to fight. Natural killer cells can act spontaneously against any such target by recognizing certain sugars on the intruder surface as well as a lack of certain self cell surface molecules. So those self surface cell molecules are unique to us. Natural killer cells are not phagocytic so they attack the target cell's membrane and release 
lytic chemicals called perforin, which poke holes, perforate uh, in the membrane and granzymes, which degrade target cells contents. Shortly thereafter, the target cell dies as its membrane nucleus disintegrate. Natural killer cells also relieve powerful inflammatory chemicals. So by saying it's not phagocytic, it doesn't engulf the um, intruder. It rather kills it. The inflammatory response is pretty non-specific. It is triggered whenever body tissues are injured, um, which you can see here in, on the right. For example, it occurs in response to physical trauma, intense heat, irritating chemicals, infection by viruses and bacteria. And the four most common indicators of inflammatory response trigger um, or the cardinal signs are redness, heat, pain, swelling. It is easy to understand why these signs and symptoms occur once you understand the events of the inflammatory response. Um, it begins with a chemical alarm. So when cells are damaged, they release inflammatory chemicals, including histamine and kinines uh, that cause blood vessels in the area to dilate, making capillaries leaky and attracting phagocytes and white blood cells to the area. Uh, so if we recall that release of chemicals attracting those white blood cells is called positive chemotaxis. Dilation of the blood vessels increases the blood flow to the area, accounting for redness and heat. Increased permeability of the capillaries allows fluid to leak from the blood into the tissue spaces, causing localized edema or localized swelling that also activates pain receptors in the area as pressure in the tissue builds. If swollen, painful, if a swollen painful area is a joint, exfunction or move, which is movement, uh, may be impaired temporarily, and this force, forces the injured part to rest, which aids in healing. Some authorities consider limitation of joint movement by the, to be the fifth cardinal sign of inflammation. The inflammatory response prevents um, the spread of damage, damaging agents to nearby tissues and disposes of cell debris and pathogens and sets the stage for, for repair. So continuing to talk about those cells and chemicals for the second line of defense, we have phagocytes. Um, pathogens that make it through the mechanical boundaries uh, or the barriers of the first line of defense are confronted with phagocytes that are in nearly every single body organ. Um, a phagocyte such as a macrophage or a neutrophil engulfs a foreign particle by the process of phagocytosis, uh, which we learned about in chapter three. Flowing cytoplasmic extensions bind to the particle and then pull it inside forming a phagocytic vesicle. The vesicle then fuses with a lysosome where enzymes digest the contents. Um, and that's what we're seeing in uh, the top image. Uh, that first part of the top image on the left, a macrophage purple. So the larger purple area is uses is a macrophage, so it's a phagocyte, using its cytoplasmic extensions to ingest bacillus-shaped bacteria, which is pink, by phagocytosis. And then uh, the right side of that top in image is just reviewing the events of phagocytosis, which we just talked about. Antimicrobial protein. So a, a variety of these enhance the innate defenses, either by attacking microorganisms directly or by hindering their ability to reproduce. Uh, the most importance of these are complement and interferon. So complement refers to a group of 20 plasma proteins that circulate in the blood in an inactive active state, much like inactive clotting proteins. When complement becomes attached or fixed to foreign cells, such as bacteria, fungi, or mismatched red blood cells, it is activated and becomes a major factor in the fight against foreign cells. Uh, the complement fixation occurs when complement proteins bind to certain sugars or proteins such as antibodies on the foreign cell's surface. One result of complement fixation is the formation of the membrane attack complexes, MAC, which is what we're seeing in the bottom photo here, uh, that produces holes or pores in the foreign cell surface. And then the pores allow water to rush into the cell, causing it to burst or, or lice. Um, activated complement also amplifies the inflammatory response. 
Some of the molecules released during the activation process are vasodilators, and some are chemotaxis chemicals that attract neutrophils and macrophages in the region. Still others cause the cell membranes of the foreign cells to become sticky, so they're easy to phagocytize. This effect, that is easing phagocytosis, is called opsonization. Complement is a nonspecific defense mechanism that complements or enhances the effectiveness of both innate and adaptive defenses. Complement proteins must be activated in a particular sequence called a cascade, which ensures that complement that complement is not accidentally activated. Interferon um, So viruses are unique acellular particles um, that lack cellular machinery required to generate ATP or make proteins. They do work in the body by taking over target cells, then using cellular machinery and nutrients to then reproduce themselves. So they steal the mechanics of a, of a host cell in order to continue to reproduce. So Virus infected cells can do little to save themselves. Uh, they help defend cells that have not yet been infected by secreting small proteins called interferons. So the interferon molecules diffuse to nearby cells and bind to their membrane receptors. And this binding stimulates a synthesis of proteins that will interfere with the ability of viruses to multiply within these healthy cells, uh, therefore reducing the spread of the virus. They do not assist with fighting bacterial fungal infections. So these are specific to viruses. And then fever. Um, as we learned, uh, temperature is regulated by the hypothalamus. Um, fever is just defined as abnormally high body temperature, and it's a systemic response to invading microorganisms. Um, normally, a thermostat of the body is set at approximately 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can be, be reset upwards by the release of pyrogens, which are chemicals secreted by white blood cells and macrophages exposed to foreign cells or substances in the body. Um, high fevers are dangerous because excess heat can essentially denature protein structures, um, enzymes, etc. Causing them to be non functional, but a mild to moderate fever seems to benefit the body. Um, bacteria require large amounts of iron and zinc to multiply, but during a fever, the liver and spleen rather gather up these nutrients, making them less available. It also increases the, meta increases the metabolic rate of tissue cells in general, speeding up repair processes. On this slide, we'll just talk about the phagocytic mobilization during inflammation. So we can see uh, our surface membrane has been disrupted here. They, somebody stepped on a nail, somebody got hit with a nail gun, what have you. There is a nail that has broken through the epidermis. Step one, uh, neutrophils responding to a gradient of diffusing inflammatory chemicals enter the blood from the bone marrow and roll along the blood vessels following the scent, quote unquote. Uh, at the point where the chemical signal, signal is strongest, they flatten out and squeeze through the space between cells and the capillary walls, a process called diapodesis, which we learned about a couple lectures ago. Still drawn by a gradient of inflammatory chemicals, positive chemotaxis, the neutrophils gather at the site of tissue injury, and within an hour, they are busily, de busily devouring any foreign material present by phagocytosis. As the counterattack continues, monocytes follow neutrophils in the inflamed area. Um, monocytes are fairly poor phagocytes, but within 12 hours after entering the tissue, they become macrophages with insatiable appetites. They continue to wage the battle, replacing the short-lived neutrophils at the site of the damage, and they are the central actors in the final disposal of cell debris in the, as the inflammation subsides. Um, besides phagocytosis, uh, other protective events are occurring at the inflamed site. As we know, this would probably cause bleeding, so clotting proteins are being leaked to the area and activated and begin to repair that damaged wall, eventually causing um, you know, the fibrin clot or the fibrin plug to, to be created, not letting any further bacteria or organisms in, microorganisms into the area.
Now let's talk about the third line of defense, adaptive body defenses. Um, the immune response is antigen specific. Defense is mounted by activated lymphocytes, so those T cells and B cells. Um, it's a response to a threat that involves tremendously increased internal nonspecific defenses, so things like the inflammatory response and others, but also provides protection that is carefully targeted against specific antigens. So our body encounters an antigen that then sensitizes the system um, so that it will recognize and react more vigorously at the next encounter. Referred to as the body's third line of defense, the adaptive or specific defense mechanism is a functional system that recognizes foreign molecule, molecules called antigens and acts to inactivate or destroy them. Normally, it protects us from a wide variety of pathogens as well as from abnormal cells. Um, failure or malfunctioning of the system can be pretty devastating, leading to things like cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, and AIDS. Uh, note that the study of immunity is called immunology. Um, Many experiments have been done throughout the centuries, really, and you know, surrounding the idea of the adaptive specific defense, and it has come up, it has ended up with these three important aspects. It is antigen specific, meaning that it recognizes and acts against particular pathogens or foreign substances. It is systemic. Immunity is not restricted to uh, initial infection site and it has memory. So it will recognize and mount even stronger, faster attacks uh, on previously encountered antigens. There are two separate but overlapping arms of the adaptive defense system. Humoral immunity, also known as antibody-mediated antibody immunity, uh, and cellular immunity, also known as cell-mediated immunity. So in humoral immunity, um, it's provided by antibodies, so immune proteins present in the body's humors, so or fluids. Uh, when lymphocytes themselves defend the body, it's cell-mediated immunity. Um, the cellular arm has, has cellular targets, virus-infected cells, cancer cells, cells of foreign grafts. The lymphocytes act, act against such targets either directly or by lysing the foreign cells uh, by lysing the foreign cells or indirectly by releasing chemicals that enhance the inflammatory response or activate the immune cells. Um, before we describe the humoral and cellular responses individually, we will consider both the remarkable cells involved in, in these immune responses and the antigens that trigger their activity. So we just established antigens are what will trigger or sensitize the system. So any substance that's capable of provo provoking an immune response is an antigen. Uh, these foreign antigens are large, complex molecules that are not normally present in our bodies, and consequently our body sees them as non-self or foreign intruders. An almost limitless variety of substances can act as antigens, including virtually all foreign proteins, nucle nucleic acids, many large carbohydrates, and some lipids. Of these, proteins provoke the strongest response. Pollen grains and microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, fungi, and virus par particles are antigenic because their surfaces bear such foreign molecules. Our own uh, cells are richly studded with a variety of protein and carbohydrate molecules. As our immune system develops, it, what I found. it takes inventory of all these molecules so that thereafter they are recognized as self. These, so these are called self antigens. They don't trigger our immune system or our immune response in us. They are strongly antigenic to other people. So we kind of touched on this when we were talking about blood transfusion. Um, this will also help explain why our bodies reject cells of transplanted organs or foreign grafts unless special measures like um, anti-rejection meds and uh, typing and cross-matching are taken to cripple or stifle the immune system, or immune response rather. In unusual situations where self antigens do elicit an immune response, this is how autoimmune disease uh, results. 
as a rule, small molecules are not antigenic, and when they, but when they link up with our own proteins, the immune system may recognize the combination as a foreign um, thing and mount an attack that is harmful rather than protective. In such cases, the troublesome small molecule is called haptin, um, or incomplete antigen. Besides certain drugs, chemicals that act as haptins are found in poison ivy, animal dander, and even some detergents, hair dyes, cosmetics, and other commonly used household and industrial products. Now let's talk about the cells of the adaptive defense system. Um, the crucial cells of the adaptive defense system are lymphocytes and antigen presenting cells, so APCs. We already discussed uh, the unique lymphocytes called natural killer cells as part of the innate defenses. Lymphocytes exist in two major categories. We have B lymphocytes or B cells, which produce antibodies and oversee, oversee humoral immunity um, and T cells or T lymphocytes that constitute the cell mediated arm of the adaptive defenses and do not make antibodies. T lymphocytes can recognize and eliminate um, specific virus infected or tumor cells and B lymphocytes can target specific extracellular antigens. In contrast, APCs do not respond to specific antigens but instead play an essential role in activating the lymphocytes that do. So like all blood cells, lymphocytes originate from the hemocytoblast and the red bone marrow. The immature or naive lymphocytes released from the marrow are essentially identical. Whether a given lymphocyte will mature into a B cell or a T cell depends on where in the body it becomes immunocompetent. That is, where it becomes capable of responding to a specific antigen by binding to it with antigen-specific receptors that appear on the lymphocyte surface. Um, T cells arise from, so you can kind of follow along on the image, but T cells arise from lymphocytes that migrate to the thymus. They, there they undergo a maturation process lasting two to three days, directed by the thymic hormone, so thymosin and others. Within the thymus, the immature lymphocytes divide rapidly and their numbers increase enormously, but only those maturing T cells with the sharpest ability to identify foreign antigens will survive. Lymphocytes capable of binding strongly with self antigens and acting against body cells are vigorously weeded out and destroyed. Thus, the development of self tolerance for the body's own cells is an essential part of a lymphocyte's quote unquote education. This is, a, this is true not only of T cells, but also for B cells. B cells develop uh, immunocompetence in the bone marrow, but less is known about the factors that regulate B cell maturation. Once a lymphocyte is immunocompetent, it will be able to react to one or only, to one and only one distinct antigen. Because all the antigen receptors on its external surface are the same, meaning they are specific to the same antigen. For example, the receptors for one lymphocyte can recognize only a part of hepatitis A virus. Those of another lymphocyte can only recognize uh, pneumococcus bacteria, etc. Although all the details of maturation process are still being worked out, we know that lymphocytes become immunocompetent before meeting the antigens they may, they may later attack. Thus, it is our genes, not antigens, that determine what foreign substances our immune system will be able to recognize and resist. Only some of the possible antigens our lymphocytes are programmed to resist will ever invade our bodies. Consequently, only some members of our army of immunocompetent cells will be mobilized during our lifetime. So, Again, following along on the picture, although they become immunocompetent, both T cells and B cells migrate to the lymph nodes um, and spleen and loose connective tissues where their encounters with antigens will occur. Then when the lymphocytes bind with recognized antigens, they complete their differentiation from those naive cells into fully mature T cells and B cells. Mature lymphocytes, especially T cells, circulate continuously throughout the body. And this makes sense because circulating greatly increases a lymphocyte's chance of coming into contact with antigens, as well as with huge numbers of macrophages and other lymphocytes along the way. Antigen-presenting cells. So 
The major role of APCs in immunity is to engulf antigens and then present fragments of them, like signal flags, on their surfaces, on their own surfaces, where they can be recognized by T cells. Uh, in other words, they present antigens to the cells that will actually deal with the antigens. The major types of APCs are dendritic cells, macrophages, and B lymphocytes. Dendritic cells are present in connective tissues and in the epidermis, uh, also called longer Hahn cells. Macrophages are widely distributed throughout the lymphoid organs and connective tissues where they act as phagocytes in the innate defense system, and they tend to remain fixed in lymphoid organs. Activated macrophages, um, are true killers that are, are insatiable phagocytes and secrete bactericidal or bacteria killing chemicals. Um, in addition to T cell circulation and passive cell, passive delivery of antigens to lymphoid organs by lymphatics, the third antigen capture and delivery system, migration of dendritic cells to secondary, secondary lymphoid organs. With their long wispy extensions, dendritic cells are very efficient at antigen catchers. Once they've engulfed antigens by phagocytosis, they enter nearby lymphatics to get to a lymphoid organ where they will present the antigens to T cells. Um, dendritic cells are the most effective antigen presenters known as it is their only job. They are a key link between innate and adaptive immunity. They initiate adaptive immune response, particularly tailored to a type of pathogen that they have encountered. To summarize, the adaptive immune system is a two-fisted defensive system with a humoral arm and a cellular arm. It uses lymphocytes, APCs, and specific molecules to identify and destroy substances, both living and non-living, uh, that are in the body but are not recognized as self. The immune system's ability to respond to such threats depends on its ability of its cells to, one, recognize foreign substances or antigens, and two, to communicate with one another so that the system as a whole mounts a response specific to those antigens. So let's talk a little bit more about humoral or antibody mediated immune response. So an immunocompetent, but as yet immature, so a naive B lymphocyte is stimulated to complete its development when antigens bind to its surface receptors. This binding event sensitizes or activates the lymphocyte to switch on or undergo clonal selection. In this process, the lymphocyte begins to grow and then multiplies rapidly to form an army of cells exactly like itself, bearing the same antigen-specific receptors. So we can kind of see this in the first image on the left. The resulting family of identical cells descended from the same ancestor cell are called clones, and the clone formation is the primary humoral response to that antigen. So that's what we're seeing in the image. The initial meeting of the antigen stimulates the primary response in which the B cell divides rapidly, forming many clones, clonoselection, most of which become antibody producing plasma cells. Cells that do not differentiate into plasma cells become memory cells, which are primed to respond to subsequent exposures to that same antigen. Should such a meeting occur, the memory cells quickly produce more memory cells and larger numbers of effector plasma cells with the same antigen specificity. specificity. And responses generated by memory cells are called secondary responses. Most of the B cell clone members or descendants become plasma cells. After an initial period, these antibody producing factories swing into action, producing the same highly specific antibodies at an unbelievable rate of about 2000 antibody molecules per second. The level of antibody in the blood during this primary response peaks about 10 days after the response begins and then slowly declines, which we can see in the right image. Um, so you can see in the primary response, the level of antibodies in the blood gradually rises and then rapidly declines. And then the secondary response is both more rapid and more intense uh, and the antibody level remains high for much longer. So the primary response is when we're getting sensitized, creating these antibodies and the secondary response is we have these antibodies to respond. Uh, B cell clone members that do not become plasma cell become plasma cells become long-lived memory cells, capable of responding to the same antigen if they quote unquote see it again. Memory cells are responsible for the immunological memory mentioned earlier, 
These later responses are called secondary humoral responses, which we can also see in the graph. They produce much faster, more prolonged, more effective than the event in the, events in the primary response because the preparations for this attack have already been made. So it's knowing the old enemy. Within two to three days, the blood level of antibody level peaks um, and the level remains high for weeks or months. Active and passive humoral immunity. So when your B cells encounter antigens and produce antibodies against them, you are exhibiting active immunity. Active immunity is one, naturally acquired during bacterial or viral infections, during which we may develop the signs and symptoms of the disease and suffer a little or a lot, and two, artificially acquired when we receive vaccines. So I'm sure you've heard both of these phrases over and over and over and over again. Um, it makes little difference whether the antigen invades the body under its own power or is introduced on purpose in the form of vaccine. The response of the immune system is pretty much the same. Indeed, once it was recognized, it was recognized that secondary responses are much more vigorous. The race was on to develop vaccines to prime the immune response by providing the first meeting with various antigens. Most vaccines contain pathogens that are dead or attenuated, uh, living but less able or unable to cause disease. Um, so we're still talking about active. We receive two benefits from vaccines. One, they spare us most of the signs and symptoms and discomfort of the disease that would otherwise occur during a primary response. And two, the weakened antigens that are still, are still able to stimulate antibody production and promote immunological memory. Booster so shots may intensify an immune response at later meetings with the same antigens. Uh, vir vaccines have virtually wiped out smallpox, are currently available against microorganisms. Uh, that cause pneumonia, polio, tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, and many other diseases. In the United States, active immunization programs have dramatically reduced the incidence of potentially serious childhood diseases. The more children who are vaccinated, the better the herd immunity, a phenomenon in which the population of people are generally protected because most of the given population is immune to a disease or infection. Herd immunity prevents an outbreak of the disease or infection and thus helps protect the individuals who are not, who have not been immunized or cannot get immunized. So passive immunity is different from active, both in antibody source and in the degree of protection it provides. Instead of being made by your plasma cells, antibodies are obtained from the serum of an immune human or animal donor. As a result, your B cells are not challenged by the antigen, immunological memory does not occur, and the temporary protection provided by the donated antibodies ends when they naturally degrade in the body. Passive immunity, excuse me. Passive immunity is conferred naturally on a fetus when the mother's antibodies cross the placenta and enter the fetal circulation and after birth during breastfeeding. For several months and after birth, the baby is protected from all antigens to which the mother has been exposed. Passive immunity is artificially conferred when a person receives immune serum or gamma globulin, so donated antibodies, like monoclonal antibodies. Gamma globulin is commonly administered after exposure to hepatitis. Other immune sera are used to treat poisonous snake bites, like antivenom, uh, to treat botulism, rabies, and tetanus, uh, because these diseases will kill a person before active immunity can be established. The donated antibodies provide immediate protection, but their effect is short-lived, about two to three weeks. Um, meanwhile, the body's own defenses take over. In addition to their use to provide, to provide passive immunity, um, antibodies are prepared commercially for use in research and diagnostic te to testing and in treating certain cancers. Monoclonal antibodies used for such purposes are descendants of a single cell and are pure antibody preparations that exhibit specificity to one and only one antigen. Besides their use in delivering cancer-fighting drugs to cancerous tissues, monoclonal antibodies are being used for early cancer diagnosis and to track cancers hidden deep within the body. They are also used for diagnosing pregnancy, hepatitis, and rabies. Now let's talk a little bit more about antibodies. So antibodies are also referred to as immunoglobulins. Um, they constitute the gamma globulin part of blood proteins. 
Antibodies are soluble proteins secreted by activated B cells or by their plasma cell offspring in response to an antigen, and they are, cap and they are capable of binding specifically to that antigen. And antibodies are formed by different B cells in response to a huge number of different antigens. Despite their variety, they all have some similar basic anatomy that allows them to be grouped into five Ig classes, each slightly different in structure and function, which we'll go over here in the right. So on the left, we're looking at basic antibody structure. So regardless of its class, every antibody has a basic structure consisting of four polypeptide change, chains linked together by disulfide, sulfur to sulfur bonds. Two of the four chains are identical. They are the heavy chains. The other two chains, the light chains, are also identical to each other, but are only about half as long as the heavy chains. When the four chains are combined, the antibody molecule formed has two identical halves, each consisting of a heavy and a light chain, and the molecule as a whole is commonly described as being Y-shaped, because clearly it looks like a Y. Um, when scientists began investigating antibody structure, they discovered something very peculiar. Each of the four chains forming an antibody had a variable or a V region at one end and a constant region, a C region at the other end. Antibodies responding to different antigens had different variable regions and their constant regions were the same or nearly the same. This made sense when it was discovered that the variable regions of the heavy and light chains combined their efforts to form an antigen binding site uniquely shaped to fit a specific antigen. Hence, each antibody has two such antigen binding regions. The constant regions that form the stem of an antibody can be compared to the handle of a key. A key handle has a common function for all keys. It allows you to hold the key and place it in a tumbler moving portion of the lock. Similarly, the constant regions of the antibody chains serve as common functions in all antibodies. They determine the type of antibody formed, so the antibody class, as well as how the antibody class will carry out its immune roles in the body and the cell types or chemicals with which the antibody can bind. So the five major immunoglobulin globulin classes are IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgE. So remember the name MADGE to recall the five Ig types. Antibodies IgD, IgG, and IgE have the same basic Y-shaped structure described previously and are referred to as monomers. Uh, IgA antibodies occur in both monomer and dimer meaning two linked monomers um, in both of those forms, and only the dimer form is shown in the table. And because they are constructed of five linked monomers, IgM mo antibodies are called pentamers, so penta meaning five. Um, so you can see here in the chart uh, where they're found and the biological function. So IgM is attached to a B cell free in the plasma when bound to B cell membranes serve as antigen receptor. First Ig class released by plasma cells during primary response, potent agglutinating agent fixes complement. IgA, some monomer in plasma, um, dimer and secretions such as saliva, tears, and intestinal juice and milk, uh, bathes and protects mucosal surfaces from the attachment of pathogens. IgD, almost always attached to B cell, believed to to be cell surface receptor of immunocompetent B cell and important in active activation of B cell. IgG, most abundant antibody in plasma, represents 75 to 85% of circulating antibodies. Main antibody in, of both the primary and secondary responses, crosses placenta and provides passive immunity to fetus, fixes complement. And then IgE, secreted by plasma cells in skin, mucosa, the GI and respiratory tracts, and tonsils. Binds to mast cells and basophils and triggers release of histamine and other chemical mediators of inflammation and some allergic responses. Now let's look at some of the mechanism of, mechanisms of antibody action. So antibodies inactivate antigens in a number of ways by complement fixation, neutralization, agglutination, opsonization, and precipitation. Of these, complement fixation and neutralizations are the most important to body protection. So complement is the chief antibody ammunition used against cellular antigens such as bacteria or mismatched red blood cells. As noted earlier, complement is fixed or activated during innate defenses and when it binds to antibodies attached to a cellular target. Antibody binding also tags antigens 
for phagocytosis, a process called opsidization. Neutralization occurs when antibodies bind to specific sites, usually at or close to the site where a cell would bind on bacterial, bacterial exotoxins, so toxic proteins secreted by bacteria, or on viruses that can cause cell injury. In this way, they block harmful effects of the exotoxin or virus by preventing them from binding to body cells. Because antibodies have more than one antigen binding site, they can bind to more than one antigen at a time. Consequently, antigen antibody complexes can be cross-linked into large lattices. When the cross-linking involves cell-bound antigens, the process cause, causes clumping of the foreign cells in a process called agglutination. agglutination. This type of antigen antibody re reaction occurs when mismatched blood is transfused. So we did learn about this. Um, and that's why we do type and cross matching. Um, when the cross linking process involves soluble antigenic molecules, the resulting antigen antibody complexes are so large that they become insoluble and settle out of solution. The cross linking reaction is more precisely called precipitation. Such agglutinated bacteria and immobilized or precipitated antigen molecules are much more easily captured and then engulfed by the body's phagocytes uh, than our freely moving antigens. Now let's look at cellular immune response, so cell mediated. So the main difference between the two arms of the adaptive response is that B cells secrete their antibody weapons, whereas T cells fight their antigens directly in quote unquote cell to cell combat. Like B cells, immunocompetent C cells, T cells rather, are activated to form a clone by binding with a recognized antigen. Uh, however, unlike B cells, T cells are not able to bind with free antigens. Instead, the antigens must be presented by a macrophage or an antigen presenting cell and a double and a double recognition must occur. The APC engulfs an antigen and processes it internally. Parts of the processed antigen are then displayed on the external surface of the presenting cell in combination with one of the APC's own proteins. In effect, the APC is saying, hey, this is your target. Note that there are different classes of effector T cells, those that carry out direct activities. Um, two types that are involved in the activation process are called helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. We will discuss more about the functions of these cells as we work through the, this process. It is important to note that although we are discussing humoral antibody mediated immunity and cell mediated immunity separately, many pathogens stimulate both branches at the same time. Um, so here in this diagram we're looking at T cell activation and interactions with other cells of the immune response. So, Dendritic cells are important antigen presenting cells. So after they ingest an antigen, they display parts of it on its on their surface where it can be recognized by a helper T cell specific to the same antigen. During the binding process, the helper T cell binds simultaneously to the antigen into the APC self receptor, which lead to helper T cell activation and cloning. If the APC is a macrophage, it releases cytokines, which enhance helper T cell activation. Activated helper T cells release cytokines, which stimulate proliferation and activity of other helper T cells and help activate B cells and cytotoxic T cells. So cells and molecules imbued in, uh, involved in immunity. So cells, we have B cell, which is a lymphocyte that resides in the lymph nodes, spleen, or other lymphoid tissues where it is in induced to replicate by antigen binding and helper T cell interactions. Its progeny or clone members form plasma cells and memory cells. Plasma cell is antibody producing machine, produces huge numbers of the same antibody, immunoglobulin, specialized B cell clone descendant. A helper T cell is a T cell that binds with a specific antigen presented by an APC. It stimulates the production of other immune cells, cytotoxic T cells and B cells to help fight the invader, acts both directly and indirectly by releasing cytokines. Cytotoxic T cell, actively enhanced by helper T cells. Um, its specialty is killing cells that, with intracellular antigens like viruses or some bacteria, as well as body cells that be, have become cancerous. Um, and these are involved in graft rejection. 
regulatory T cell slows or stops the activity of B and T cells once the infection or attack of foreign cells has been conquered, thought to be important in preventing autoimmune diseases. Memory cell descendant of an activated B cell or T cell generated bo during both primary and secondary immune responses may exist in the body for years thereafter and enabling it to respond quickly and efficiently to subsequent infections or meetings with the same antigen an antigen presenting cell. Uh, any of several cell types, macrophage, dendritic cell, B cell that engulfs and digests antigens that it encounters and presents parts of them on its plasma membrane for recognition by T cells bearing receptors for the same antigen. This function, called antigen presentation, is essential for normal cell-mediated responses. Macrophages and dendritic cells also release chemicals that activate many other immune cells. And then the molecules. We have antibodies, which we just went over, cytokines, which are chemicals released by sensitized T cells, macrophages, and certain other cells, um, migration inhibitory factor, MIF, inhibits macrophage migration and keeps them in the local areas and regulates the production of other pro-inflammatory cytokines. Interleukin-2 stimulates T cells and B cells to proliferate, activates not natural killer cells. Helper factors enhance antibody formation by plasma cells. Suppressor factors suppress antibody formation or T cell mediated immune responses. Chemotactic factors attract leukocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils into an inflamed area. Gamma interferon secreted by lymphocytes helps make tissue cells resistant to viral infection and activates macrophages and natural killer cells, enhances maturation of cytotoxic T cells. And then tumor necrosis factor TNF, like perforin, causes cell killing, attracts granulocytes, activates T cells and macrophages, complement group of bloodborne proteins activated after binding to antibody covered antigens. When activated, complement causes lysis of the microorganisms, enhances inflammatory response. Antigen, substance capable of provoking an immune response, typically a large and complex molecule, not normally present in the body. And cytotoxins, perforin, granzyme, cell toxins released by cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. Cytotoxic T cells. So this is a proposed mechanism by which cytotoxic T cells kill target cells. Um, they specialize in killing virus infected cancer or foreign graft cells directly. Um, so one, they bind tightly to a foreign cell, and two, release toxic chemicals called perforin and granzymes from its granules. The glycoprotein porphyrin then three enters the foreign cell's plasma membrane, delivering the so-called lethal hit. Shortly thereafter, pores appear in the target cell's membrane, allowing for four of the granzymes, the protein digesting enzymes, to enter and kill the foreign cell. A cytotoxic T cell then five detaches and seeks other foreign prey to attack. So this chart is just showing us a summary of the adaptive immune responses. You can see on the left, we have the humoral antibody mediated adaptive immune response. And on the right, the cellular or cell mediated adaptive immune response. Um, in, the f in the flow of the chart, the green arrows track the primary response and the blue arrows track the uh, secondary response. So this is just something for you to look over, review. I know it, it's kind of muddy. Um, this is a lot of um, information organizationally on how these different immune responses work, um, but maybe this will help you track it a little bit. Organ transplants and rejection. So there are four major types of transplants or grafts. So we have an autograft, this is transplanted from one site to another in the same person. Isografts, which are donated by genetically identical persons, so an identical twin. Allografts, tissue grafts taken from a person other than an identical twin. And then xenografts, harvested from a different animal species, such as a porcine heart valve transplanted in a human. Um, ABO and other blood group antigens or of both donor and recipient must be determined and match. And then cell membrane antigens in their tissue cells are typed. They need to be at least a 75% match. They are on lifelong immunosuppressive therapy, and roughly 50% of patients will reject their transplant within 10 years of receiving it.
Now let's talk about some disorders of immunity. First, we have allergies or hypersensitivities. Um, these are abnormally vigorous immune responses in which the immune system causes tissue damage as it fights off a perceived threat um, that would otherwise be harmless to the body. The term allergen is used to distinguish this type of antigen from those producing normal immune responses. Um, the most common type is immediate hypersensitivity or acute hypersensitivity. After sensitization, sensitization to a particular allergen, this type of response is triggered when that allergen is encountered again. The secondary response starts with a release of a flood of histamine when IgE antibodies bind to mast cells, and histamine causes small blood vessels in the area to become dilated and leaky and is largely to blame for the best recognized symptoms of allergy. So runny nose, watery eyes, itchy reddened skin, um, when the allergen is hailed, symptoms of asthma appear because smooth muscle in the walls of the bronchioles contract, constricting the passages and restricting airflow. So over-the-counter meds sometimes do work. Um, they contain antihistamines, and most of the reactions begin within seconds after contact with the allergen and last about half an hour. Of course, then we have anaphylactic shock, which is fairly rare. Uh, it occurs when the allergen directly enters the blood and circulates rapidly through the body as it might enter with a certain bee sting, spider bites, injection of a foreign substance um, into susceptible individuals. Food allergies like peanut or wheat allergies, allergies may also trigger anaphylaxis and can be fatal. Uh, the mechanism of anaphylactic shock is essentially the same as that of local response, but the entire body is involved. Uh, delayed hypersensitivities are mediated mainly by a special subgroup of helper T cells, um, cytotoxic T cells and macrophages that take much longer to appear, one to three days, than any of the acute reactions produced by antibodies. Instead of histamine, the chemicals mediating these reactions are cytokines released by the activated T cells. Hence, antihistamine drugs are not helpful against the delayed types of allergies. Uh, corticosteroid drugs are used to provide relief. Um, and this image on the right is the mechanism of immediate or acute hypersensitivity response. Then we have autoimmune diseases. So rheumatoid arthritis, which systematically destroys the joints, myasthenia gravis, which impairs communication between nerves and skeletal muscles, multiple sclerosis, which destroys the white matter or myelin sheaths of the brain and spinal cord, Graves' disease, in which the thyroid gland produces excessive amounts of thyroxine, um, in response to autoantibodies that mimic TSH. Type 1 diabetes, which destroys pancreatic beta cells, resulting in deficient production of insulin. Uh, systematic, systemic, excuse me, lupus erythem, erythematosus, Cecily, a systemic disease that occurs mainly in young women and particularly affects the kidneys, uh, heart, lungs, and skin, and glom glomerulonephritis, a severe impairment of the kidney function due to acute inflammation. Um, and then immunodeficiencies, which include both congenital and acquired conditions in which the production or function of immune cells or complement is abnormal. The most devast devastating congenital condition is severe combined immunodeficiency disease, um, in which there is a marked, marked de deficit of both B and T cells. Because T cells are absolutely required for normal operation of both arms of the adaptive response. Afflicted children have essentially no protection against pathogens of any type. Minor infections, easily shrugged off by most children, are lethal to those with SCID, SICD, bone marrow transplants, and umbilical cord blood, which provide normal lymphocyte stem cells, have helped some SICD victims. Without such treatment, the only hope of survival is living behind protective barriers or in a bubble. Currently, the most important and most devastating of the acquired immunodeficiencies is acquired immune deficiency syndrome, so AIDS. It cripples the immune system by interfering with the activity of helper T cells. Now let's look at some developmental aspects of the lymphatic system and body defenses. So lymphatic vessels and main clusters of lymph nodes are obvious by the fifth week of development. Except for the thymus and spleen, the lymphoid organs are poorly developed before birth, soon after they become heavily populated with lymphocytes. Lymphatic system problems are relatively uncommon. However, elephantitis or severe edema from lymphatics uh, removal can occur. Um, so this would be like somebody had um, 
a mastectomy and with a lymphoid lymph node removal uh, for breast cancer and it can cause swelling in that extremity. Stem cells of the immune system originate in the spleen and liver during the month of, an, of embryonic development. Later, bone marrow takes over. In late fetal life and shortly after birth, the young lymphocytes develop self-tolerance and immunocompetence in their programming organs. Nervous system may have some control over the immune response, impaired in those under severe stress. And during later years, your immune system efficiency begins to wane. So let's take a look at uh, a closer look at one of the immunodeficiencies that we talked about and that I'm sure you know about, um, AIDS. So the AIDS pandemic has been going on for nearly 40 years. Um, AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, and it's a state in which the body is immunocompromised as a result of an advanced hemo immunodeficiency virus. So it, it's HIV infection. So people can be HIV positive and not have AIDS. Not everyone who has HIV develops AIDS. According to the CDC, HIV infection has progressed to AIDS when a patient has a low count of helper T cells, also called CD4 cells because they have a receptor called CD4 on their surfaces, and or has an opportunistic infection. Examples of opportunistic infections include a fungal brain infection called cryptococcal meningitis, a rare fungal pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, a viral eye infection called cytomegalovirus retinitis or Kaposi sarcoma, a cancer-like blood vessel condition that causes purple lesions on the skin. HIV is transmitted by body fluids, blood, breast milk, semen, vaginal secretions, and is known as a sexually transmitted infection. The virus cannot be transmitted by casual contact because it dies when exposed to air, so you're not going to get it by shaking somebody's hand. Once in the body, HIV infects helper T cells and it interferes with the adaptive immune response, both humoral and cell-mediated branches. Um, as of 2018, new HIV infections globally per year numbered 1.7 million and 37.9 million people worldwide were living with HIV. Between 2000 and 2018, new infections fell by 37%. Of those infected, only 62% were receiving treatment. Since the pandemic began, so uh, over 32 million people have died. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest population of HIV-infected individuals with more than two-thirds of world, the world's cases. When the HIV pandemic began, hemophiliacs, homosexual males, were at the highest risk of becoming infected. Though clotting factors for hemophiliacs are now genetically engineered and pretty safe, homosexual men remain at high risk, as do IV drug users. According to the CDC, in 2018, uh, youth ages 13 to 24 made up 21% of new H HIV cases in the United States. Young adults ages 25 to 34 made up 36% of new cases. As of 2018, one in seven HIV infected people in the United States did not know um, that they were infected and were not receiving treatment, increasing the likelihood of passing on the infection. The CDC cites numerous challenges to halting the spread of HIV, lack of adequate sex education and behavioral factors such as failing to undergo testing, engaging in unsafe sex, and having multiple sexual partners. Uh, what you're looking at at the bottom is just a new HIV virus emerging from an infected human cell. Treatment and prevention. At present, there is no HIV vaccine available. People who test positive for HIV are given antiretroviral therapies, also called combination therapies. Uh, that include reverse transcriptase, an HIV enzyme inhibitor, protease inhibitors, infusion inhibitors to block entry into T cells. Controlling the virus can delay and in some cases prevent the onset of AIDS. The earlier the patient begins treatment, the greater the chance of good prognosis. Uh, people who engage in high-risk behavior should offer regular testing uh, and try to adopt safer sex practices. Abstinence remains the on only 100% method of prevention. So the essentials. Results, um, AIDS results when HIV infection progresses to the point where the body becomes immunocompromised. HIV infects helper T cells, resulting in deficiency in both the humoral and cell-mediated adaptive immune responses. Treatment often includes a combination of drugs and it's transmitted via body fluids and sexually. And sexually.
Any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to let me know.